my name is Sam Neiman, and the, with my colleague Niran De Silva, KC, uh, we are going to be talking to you about computer imaging and inspection orders, which segues nicely from Adam's talk because it deals with fraudulent employees. Specifically, we're going to set out for you recent Court of Appeal authority and guidance on applying for such orders. We're going to highlight areas of uncertainty that remain despite the Court of Appeal. We're going to help you, I hope, navigate through those uncertain areas and give you some practical tips on how to approach the issue, whether you are representing the claimant or the defendant in this kind of application. So uh, picture the situation. Your client comes to you having discovered that its ex-employees have downloaded your client's confidential information and set up in competition or just gone off to uh, join a competitor. In those circumstances, your client is unlikely to be massively impressed uh, simply by being told that it can get a confidentiality injunction or even uh, an order to deliver up whatever confidential information uh, the employees uh, say they took. Your clients are likely to be very cross, very concerned, and above all, very suspicious. They're going to want to see for themselves what is on the ex-employees, computers, mobile phones, tablets, and so on. In short, they will want to be allowed to image and inspect those devices. To what extent will you be able to give them what they want? Or if you're for a defendant, to what extent will you be able to resist an application? Well, the issue with this type of order becomes obvious pretty quickly. Firstly, looking indiscriminately through the entirety of other people's computers and phones is clearly immensely intrusive. There's a potential breach of their Article 8 human rights. And you're, of course, highly likely to come across their confidential information, which they don't want you to see. And worse still, privileged communications with their lawyers. Secondly, this type of order turns the whole disclosure process upside down in a sense that it creates a situation where it's the claimant that is searching the defendant's files for the defendant's disclosable documents and effectively the claimant choosing what the defendant is going to disclose uh, in the litigation. And also it creates a situation where the claimant gets the defendant's documents before, long before, the defendant gets the claimant's documents. But despite these fundamental obstacles, I'm going to suggest that this type of order is still a very useful weapon in the armory of the claimant. A carefully constructed application will often be at least sufficiently successful to stop a defendant in their tracks uh, and give you the upper hand in the litigation going forward. Uh, if, however, you're for a defendant, there's still plenty of scope to resist if you know where to focus your opposition especially if the claimant hasn't been careful in how they have formulated their application. So what are the principles on which the courts will grant imaging and inspection orders? Surprisingly, there's only one Court of Appeal case on this topic, and we had to wait till 2021 to get that. It's the case of TBD Owen Holland against Simons and others. Now, the central takeaway from TBD is that although we talk of imaging and inspection orders as though they were one composite whole, one, one order, imaging and inspection are in fact two separate and sequential steps requiring separate consideration and different tests. As the Court of Appeals said, Imaging can only ever be a preservation step and must be followed by proper consideration of the issues of disclosure of the documents thereby preserved. 
In other words, the justification for imaging a defendant's documentation is preservation. You don't need to go on to look at them. You don't need to inspect them in order to preserve them. You've already done that. You've already achieved it by the imaging order. Whether you're entitled to go on and inspect and look at these documents, and if so, when and in what circumstances, is a different and subsequent question. So what guidance did the Court of Appeal give? Dealing first with the imaging stage, and remember, imaging is about preservation, nothing else. The Court of Appeal said this. The basic safeguard required in imaging orders is that, save in exceptional circumstances, save in exceptional cases, the images should be kept in the safekeeping of the forensic computer expert and not searched or inspected by anyone until the return date. If there's to be any departure from this, it requires a very high degree of justification and must be specifically and explicitly approved by the court. Now, in giving this guidance, the Court of Appeal removed, or perhaps more accurately, kicked down the road, basically all the obstacles and objections that are traditionally put up uh, in opposition to these orders. The problems of seeing the other side's confidential, privileged or private documents. And they did so precisely because at this imaging stage, uh, the claimant isn't going to be seeing anything. Remember, it's just preservation. And the Court of Appeal, in fact, went so far as to say that an imaging order, in other words, the first of these two stages, is a relatively non-intrusive process. But as I've said, this was to an extent just loading all the problems onto the next stage, the inspection stage. Because there, of course, the court does have to grapple with whether the claimant sees the defendant's documents, when, under what conditions, what safeguards need to be put in place to ensure that the defendant's confidentiality and privacy and privilege are maintained. So that's the difficult bit. What did the Court of Appeal say about that? Well, Lord Justice Arnold said this, he said, on the return date, consideration must be given to the timing and methodology of disclosure and inspection of the documents captured in the images. The presumption, and here, here is the test, the presumption should be that it will be for the defendant to give disclosure of such documents in the normal way. In other words, the presumption is once you've got the image, it sits in the computer experts filing cabinet or vault or on the, in the cloud, and it stays there. And the defendant then just gives disclosure in the usual way. However, the presumption can be departed from where there is sufficient justification. But even then, the methodology of the search must either be agreed between the parties or approved by the court. So the default position when it comes to the inspection stage of this is that now you have a snapshot of the defendant's devices safely stored in the expert's filing cabinet or hard disk. The image documents just sit there unless there is sufficient justification, quote unquote, to depart from that default position. Well, what might that sufficient justification be? At this point, things get a bit vague. The closest we get in TBD to any kind of answer is the Court of Appeals approval of guidance that was given in a previous case, 2019 case, uh, of A against B. Now, in that case, Mr Justice Mann gave the guidance that we see on the slide here, and he says, if there's to be an inspection of documents of the, on the images at this first stage and by the claimants, then it needs to be justified as a separate exercise and analysed in terms of the disclosure jurisdiction. So in a sense, that's just uh, parroting what the Court of Appeal have done formally, which is to separate out the imaging and inspection process. Then he says the decision whether to allow it, like any other dispute about disclosure, has to be dealt with on the basis of the particular facts of a particular case. And there'll be many factors potentially in play. Now, as practitioners, you may 
think that those two pieces of guidance aren't massively helpful. Uh, however, there it is, that's what he said. And he did set out six factors, which he appeared to say would always form part of the process. Uh, you could probably guess them. Firstly, whether the defendant can be trusted to carry out the disclosure process properly. Secondly, the risk that the defendant would honestly miss the relevance of some document. Thirdly, although it says two there, apologies for that, urgency. Fourthly, the use of search terms. Fifthly, greater administrative resources of the claimant. And sixthly, the existence of privileged or confidential private documents in the hands, obviously, the, the defendant's privileged or private documents. And the Court of Appeal approved this checklist, only adding that if there was to be use of such terms, uh, the search terms, they had to be agreed between the parties or determined by the court. In other words, the claimant couldn't just go off and trawl the images based on unilaterally decided search terms. So after TBD, where are we on this second inspection stage? Well, we at least have an unequivocal starting point. Namely, that even if an imaging order, even if the claimants manage to get an imaging order, thereafter, the presumption is that it's disclosure as usual. At the usual point in the litigation timetable, the defendant chooses what it discloses. The claimant can't just trawl the images. However, as we've seen, the test for whether and when this presumption, this norm should be departed from is general, to say the least. And again, as practitioners and people advising your clients, I suspect it's going to be quite difficult uh, for you to advise your client with any certainty when this presumption is going to be reversed and your client's going to be able to effectively hijack the disclosure process. Does that matter? Now, I mustn't trespass on Niran's talk, which uh, I know will focus on the more practical issues uh, moving forward. But in my personal view, if as a claimant, you can obtain an imaging order, in other words, number one. Firstly, your client will regard it as a win. And secondly, as a matter of practice, if nothing else, the knowledge that a snapshot image exists, albeit tucked away in a filing cabinet in the expert's office, will without doubt concentrate the mind of any defendant who might be tempted to be less than honest in the forthcoming subsequent uh, disclosure process, even if they go first and they choose what they disclose. And indeed, if you've caught the defendant in the act, so to speak, with your imaging order, uh, that might be all you need as a claimant to bring the litigation to a swift end. And even if it doesn't bring the litigation to a swift end, if at the disclosure stage, you as a claimant have got good reason to argue that the defendant is at this point not being honest or full with their disclosure, then you could consider applying for a disclosure order. In other words, part two of this imaging and inspection, an inspection order at that point. So all good reasons to go for an imaging order. But it's all very well me saying go for an imaging order, you may have noticed that when giving its guidance on imaging orders, the Court of Appeal in TBD didn't actually set out what the test should be for when to get an imaging order. All it said was that an imaging order is comparatively non-intrusive, but it didn't say what you had to do to get one. So what test does apply at the imaging stage? What do you need to show to get an imaging order? Here, the law, I'm afraid, is in something of a mess. And in truth, the authorities reveal something for everyone, depending on what cases you choose to cite. By the time TBD had got to the Court of Appeal, there were at least three obviously separate different tests for when you could get an imaging order. At its most stringent was basically the full-blown search and seize Anton Pillar type search order test. And that was set out in a case called CBS Butler. And uh, it's a long quote, but I've underlined the, the crucial bits. It, the judge sets out the requirement 
for a of a paramount need to prevent a denial of justice to the claimant which in practice means that the claimant has to show substantial reasons for believing that a defendant is intending to conceal or destroy documents in breach of his disclosure obligations so that's the first test high bar somewhere in the middle in terms of stringency anyway uh, was the test set out in a case called Feistos and Ho. And there the test was that the order had to be, quote unquote, necessary and proportionate. And then at the other extreme of, let's call it leniency, the lowest bar, uh, was the test set out in a case called Warm Zones against Thurley, Warm Zones and Thurley. And here the judge, no lesser judge than Mrs. Justice Simler, as she then was, uh, treated these orders effectively just as a species of interim injunction, adjuncts to the confidentiality and delivery up orders that were being sought alongside. And she simply applied the low bar American cyanamide test, albeit tweaked for mandatory in interim injunctions. And although uh, it's set out on the slide there, that's basically what she said. And uh, frankly, in the years leading up to TBD in the Court of Appeal, you can find any number of different cases that apply one or other of these three different tests, and sometimes a sort of hybrid of two or more of them. And that, of course, leads to no consistency of approach at all. And therefore, you find orders being granted based on one test, which would have been refused under another, and obviously vice versa. So in this period of confusion, if you were for a claimant, but you wouldn't pass the strict high bar search and seize test, you didn't have to despair. There was a line of authority, the warm zones line, uh, which suggested you didn't need to. If on the other hand, you were for a defendant facing an application where the claimant was trying to take advantage of this low warm zones threshold, then there were plenty of authorities of equal weight suggesting that a much stricter test should be applied. In other words, when the matter came before the Court of Appeal uh, in the TBD case, the law was crying out for some sort of coherence to be imposed as to when you could get an imaging order. And you'd think the Court of Appeal would have taken the opportunity to grasp the nettle, set out one clear test for when an imaging order would be made, but they didn't. In fact, the Court of Appeal judgment, which is very long, uh, is silent on what test there should be for an imaging order. And it doesn't mention, doesn't even mention these, these three different tests. Uh, what about the numerous different authorities? First instance, conflicting first instance authorities on the point. Again, TBD doesn't even mention them, still less overrule any or try and analyze them in some coherent way. And that's where the law was left after TBD in terms of the important issue of when you get this imaging order in the first place. So what are the courts doing in respect of this important first imaging order stage post TBD? Are they still applying these different tests? Well, it seems to me, looking through the case law, that the answer is yes, they are. So, for instance, in the case of Tank and Crossan, uh, this was just an imaging, uh, th this was where an imaging order was sought in a standard employment confidential information case. We see the judge saying, second sentence, there's no evidence before me that he's likely to destroy, damage or conceal evidence. That is the high bar search and seize CBS Butler, Anton Pillar style uh, test. As you can see, it's a two sentence dismissal of the application. It gives us no clue as to the judge's reasoning or even how the application was argued. But what is clear is she applies that tough CBS Butler search and seize threshold of the likelihood of destruction of evidence. But in another case post dating TBD, it's a case called Evil and Jones against Aldis, the judge clearly did not. <laughs> 
adopt that test. Indeed, it's pretty clear reading the case that he adopted the low American cyanamide interim injunction test. Uh, in the Ordis case, the claimant sought an imaging order in the context of a claim that the defendant hadn't complied with certain contractual obligations. And the judge granted the imaging order and we can see what he said there. And it couldn't be more anodyne if you try it. The first defendant has arguably, and I put it no higher than that, shown himself as potentially willing not to comply with contractual undertakings given in the compromise of proceedings. And then he goes on to say the evidence at the moment tends to suggest, but again, I put it no higher than that, that he may not take his legal obligations as seriously as one would like. Naughty fella. Uh, well, we can all agree that that gets nowhere near the test required under the search and seize jurisprudence. It's just an application of the vanilla interim injunction test. She says to me that warm zones is alive and kicking even after TBD. So to conclude, and pulling these strings together, when dealing with imaging and inspection orders, remember that they're two completely separate orders to be dealt with separately and sequentially. Just because you get one doesn't mean you'll get the other. And as for those two orders, TBD, the Court of Appeal case, at least sets out a coherent basis for the second inspection. Uh, phase, the inspection of computers that have already been the subject of an imaging order. And that's the presumption that the defendant gives inspection in the usual way at the normal time. And whether that presumption can be departed from is one of those all the facts of the case type tests. However, as to when computers should be imaged in the first place, as we've seen, the Court of Appeal appear to have rather missed the chance to impose a bit of coherence on the position. And after TBD, the courts have used both the high bar search and seize test and the low, much lower threshold American cyanamide test in order to decide whether to grant this kind of test. And then don't forget, of course, the middling Feistos and Ho necessary and proportionate test. Uh, that hasn't been overruled by the Court of Appeal. And indeed, it was applied in a post TBD case. Uh, it's not on my slides, but it's one which Niran will refer to. So look out for it. It's called JD Classics. So if you're for a claimant, there's plenty of scope for your client to get imaging orders with all the tactical litigation advantages that this brings, even if you're unlikely to go on to get an inspection order. But if you're for a defendant, don't despair. There'll often be scope to challenge the granting of an imaging order by, as long as you know where to look, pointing to the authorities which suggest the much stricter high bar test. And I think, again, Niran is going to deal with this. If an imaging order has been obtained without notice, ex parte, and the claimant hasn't taken the court to these, this line of stricter authorities, then seems to me you'd have a shout at an application to set aside for material non-disclosure. I've gone 10 seconds over my 20 minutes, uh, but if any of you have any questions on any of this, I'll be very happy to chat them through with you outside over a cup of tea or better still a glass of wine. And I will now hand over to Niran who's going to take you through the more practical aspects of seeking these orders. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, as Sam said, I'm going to now look at some of the practical aspects of imaging orders, uh, in particular in the context of defendants who've misused confidential information. Uh, and applying some of the legal issues that Sam's identified to you um, in the context of four stages of the litigation process, firstly, without notice um, hearings. Well, we've seen that preserving evidence by imaging order can be critical to a claimant uh, in the outcome of the case, uh, perhaps as critical as a freezing order might be uh, in a more commercial um, fraud um, type case. So imaging orders, 
at their very simplest, merely require a defendant to permit someone, usually a forensic compute, computing expert appointed by the claimant, to make a copy of their devices. So computers, other devices, and of course, cloud storage uh, as well. And there is, following TBD Owen, um, a standard model order in the CPR, um, which I'm going to look at some of the, uh, the provisions of. But it's worth remembering, of course, um, at the without notice stage and other stages, um, that there might be other orders that your client should consider at this stage. The most obvious one would be just an order um, requiring the uh, defendant respondent to keep confidential uh, the information that's a subject of the order. It might be, for example, that you need an order preventing destruction of evidence. You wouldn't need that necessarily if you're getting an imaging order, but it might be, for example, that your uh, client claimant doesn't wish to incur the costs uh, of an imaging order. So that needs to be considered as well. And there's also delivery up and potentially deletion orders, normally something that would be considered at the with notice stage rather than the uh, without notice stage. Um, and then, of course, there is the search order itself. Search orders, I think, much rarer than they used to be, but worth saying that the imaging order really arose out of the jurisprudence um, around um, search orders. It used to be that they were just an adjunct to a search order. You get the search order, and as part of that, there'd be some provision in relation to um, imaging. But I think now it's fair to say imaging orders have a status um, of their own. Again, it's a standard order um, in the CPR. Um, and what was made clear in TBD Owen by the Court of Appeal is that if an imaging order is enough, does enough to preserve the evidence, then there is no need for a search order. So, so far, far from being just an adjunct to a search order, um, it is now an alternative um, to one. And Again, the, the approach of the courts, as Sam said, has been that imaging orders are less intrusive than a search order. And in a sense, they are. You don't have a supervising solicitor and um, um, uh, others traipsing around um, your home, um, gathering documents uh, and devices. Uh, but of course, they're a fairly blunt tool as well. Uh, what the claimant, their expert get is a complete image of all manager, manner of confidential, commercially sensitive, um, and of course, personal documents and even photographs. I think most defendants will be horrified at the thought um, of getting uh, such an or having such an order made um, against them, um, which is why we'll see some of the protections that we're going to look at um, in the imaging order. Um, as I say on the slide there, the statutory basis of imaging orders is the same as for search orders in Section 7, 7 of the Civil Procedure Act, um, which says the court can make an order under this section for the purpose of securing in the case of any existing or proposed proceedings in the court, the preservation of evidence, which is or may be relevant. Again, the, the, the basis of this is preservation of evidence. Another highly relevant uh, consideration for the reasons that Sam has alluded to is the duty of full and frank disclosure, um, which applies at without notice hearing, not just to issues of fact, you're not just under an obligation to say what the defendant might have said on the facts if they were there, um, but also what they might have said about the law and the relevant legal tests. And that applies then to the vexed question of what is the test you apply at um, the without notice stage for seeking and being granted an imaging order. And we've seen there are a number of candidates for this. Um, there's the um, Feistos test. Is it just necessary and proportionate? And there's a higher test that was in the case of CBS. Is there a paramount need to prevent a denial of justice to the claimant, uh, which underpins the search order test? And it makes sense to us um, that it is uh, the search order test that it's most akin to the imaging order test at this stage, at the without notice um, hearing. It is most akin to a search order, um, but moreover, there is a duty of full and frank disclosure here. Even if you went under the lower test, you have to tell the court that there might be a higher test um, that applies. And that's what the defendant respondent will be saying if they were there. So it makes sense to focus on the uh, higher, um, more stringent test of search orders, not just in submissions, but of course in the evidence uh, as well. Um, because all of these um, 
um, items will have to be satisfied. The test will be there's a strong case that's a civil cause of action, so not just serious issue to be tried. Um, the next two bullets will be issues about the evidence in question. Third bullet, does the defendant have the evidence, the documents containing the confidential information? And is it um, in, uh, um, information which is of major, if not critical, importance, which it normally will be if it's a confidential information um, case? But the key point that's really pivotal in all these cases is the fourth bullet there, the issue of um, real possibility that the evidence will be destroyed. I'm just going to quote um, from uh, the case of CBS that said this, it's not sufficient for a claimant to show no more than the defendant has misused confidential information or otherwise broken his employment contract. What a claimant must show is substantial reasons for believing that a defendant is intending to conceal or destroy documents in breach of obligations of disclosure under the CPR. So again, it's not just a question, you can't just go to court and, and, and look, at, look at breaches by the defendant to justify an imaging order. It's got to be something more than that. It's got to be destruction or concealment. Um, so again, not breach of employment terms, not breach of post-termination covenants. And that sort of evidence uh, of destruction or concealment will be, for example, evidence that they've um, uh, destroyed um, uh, the, the, their tracks in evidence on their employer's computer, perhaps even used um, wiping um, software. But it also could be, for example, dishonesty um, in dealings with their ex-employer, for example, in correspondence and their explanations for what they have done. The court will also look at the potential harm to a defendant. Um, to confirm that an order will not be disproportionate. And this is where it is relevant to consider the fact that an imaging order is less intrusive than a search order. But moreover, there are particular protections that a defendant will have, uh, given the wording of the standards um, search order, which I shall look at next. Um, standard uh, imaging order. The standard um, imaging order, as I say there, is appended to a uh, practice direction uh, 25A. Um, it's clear from its wo uh, wording that it's in intended to be used at without notice hearings. Its structure is, um, is this. The um, defendant is ordered to uh, hand over copies of their, uh, uh, kind of their devices and uh, give access to their um, cloud storage um, so that an independent computer specialist, so not the claimant, an independent computer specialist can make electronic copies um, of the documents um, or the cloud. And the order says that the applicant is not allowed to access or inspect or use the electronic copies without the permission of the court. So this um, embodies what's said by the Court of Appeal in TBD Owen that imaging is just imaging and doesn't deal with inspection um, at all. So just a couple of observations. Um, the independent computer specialist is really at the heart of the um, structure of um, these orders. And clearly one will have to be um, instructed at the time the order um, is sought. Um, and indeed it might be that um, particular advice is needed from them about what, what needs to be done in terms of copying, saving and, uh, and searchability. Um, the expert is given access to electronic data storage devices. There's a long list of, um, of those, such as electronic files, tablets, laptops, uh, and also to online accounts. Um, just a reminder in the wording of this that it's not, it's not tailored to confidential information cases, and um, there's reference to being given access to online bank accounts and payment systems, um, which would need to be deleted because that wouldn't be relevant in a confidential information um, case. Um, and um, the access is given to um, those devices or, or storage um, uh, cloud areas that contain information defined in Schedule A at the end of the order. And Schedule A is where you'd identify your confidential um, information um, that you're seeking to um, ensure um, is protected, is saved. Um, there are a number of protections um, in their various undertakings from the party from the solicitor and from the computer specialist that are similar to those um, in the um, search um, order. So that's what the standard order says. 
Uh, I want to say a little bit about what the standard order doesn't say and how it might be modified. Because as I say there in the first bullet, um, the uh, it, modification is provided for um, within the CPR. Um, um, but it needs to be expressly referred to the judge's um, attention. I think it's fairly plain that um, the, the overall structure of the imaging order, that it only applies to imaging rather than to inspection, um, can't be um, <coughs> changed. Um, and that's um, clear from um, uh, what's said in a number of cases, um, including CBS, that says that save in exceptional cases there should only be um, orders for imaging rather than for inspection and that would um, hard to see how that would uh, apply in any um, employment case um, it's been observed that there are a lot of protections that are in the search order that are not in the um, imaging order and it might be worth a look at the search order just to look at what protections might apply so for example there are some uh, safeguards for um, a defendant that are not in the imaging order um, one of them is there's no limit on the time frame for the search. Um, so um, what uh, an expert might need is actually quite a lot of time. Might you take the take the devices away in order to copy them? Uh, that would need to be provided for um, in the order. I think remembering here that the time that the defendant doesn't have access to the um, devices might be time that the defendant could turn around and say to, later on they were suffered loss because they didn't have the access have access to the devices over that period and then might try and sue on the uh, uh, cross undertaking. So doing it um, swiftly in an ordered way, um, according to a time frame set out uh, in an order is in everyone in everyone's interest. Um, also, there are provisions in the search order which are not in the imaging order, for example, about um, the explain uh, having the terms of the order explained uh, in plain English. Um, and explain the right of the uh, respondent to take advice. I think so far as the claimant um, is concerned, it might be thought, depending on the um, level of nefariousness on the part of the defendant, that there are protections that they need um, as well. And um, one of those arises from the fact that the whole structure of this um, relies on the trust uh, in, the, in the respondent to hand over the devices. Um, there's nothing that um, allows anyone to go into the home and check um, for the devices. So it might be that the order needs to be um, revised, again, with any modification being alerted to the judge um, to, for example, require specific require the um, respondent under threat of the penal notice to uh, hand over devices, perhaps serve an affidavit to the effect. But it might be in a more extreme case um, that some sort of hybrid search order is an, is needed that uh, actually enables someone to go into the defendant's home to um, find the devices um, akin to a search order. Uh, and again, unlike the um, search order, there are no gagging provisions um, preventing a respondent from tipping off someone else um, about who might have access to the confidential information, and that might be added in as well. So I'm going to look at two kinds of interim hearing next. Firstly, the return date hearing. This is the scenario where the um, ex-employer claimant has obtained the imaging order but done nothing more at the without notice um, hearing. What happens at the, um, the return date hearing? So I've listed there in the first uh, four bullets in particular um, the, the various options of what might happen with the ones most favourable to the defendant at the top and then in descending order. Because one thing that um, defendants um, commonly do is make an application for discharge based on breach of the duty to give full and frank disclosure. So it's worth noting at this point that the duty to give full and frank disclosure isn't just a duty of honesty, it's also a duty to make reasonable inquiries um, as well. So there might be um, uh, pieces of information that the claimant doesn't have, but it should have had and needs to investigate before um, applying for any without notice um, order. And then I call it applies, applies to the facts as much as to the law. But that duty of full and frank disclosure also applies, uh, for example, to the cross undertaking and damages and the evidence put forward about their ability to, um, to pay that. So the first thing the defendant will be thinking is, can we discharge um, for breach um, uh, of a, a material breach of the duty to give full and frank disclosure? That aside, 
Um, the presumption, as Sam said, is that effectively what happens after that is nothing. But actually, you've got the order there. There's a case of hood I'm going to look at about what, what might happen with um, it, uh, afterwards uh, when it comes to disclosure. But you just leave that there and the party just carry on with the litigation in the usual way. I think my experience that's actually less common because a lot, a lot of people are thinking we've got the image now in there now let's do something with it now we're here but again the presumption is that it's the defendant who will look at the image first of all but that's a presumption that can be uh, departed from where there's sufficient justification uh, and again you recall that sam took you through some of the factors ones that point to the defendant going first are is there a lot of um, privileged information? One that, one that points to the claimant looking at the disclosure first is they've got greater administrative resources. But the key factor is likely to be whether the defendant can be trusted to carry out the disclosure process properly. And although pr the presumption is that they will be able, but they, they will do it, in a lot of these cases, the defendant won't be trusted. That will be the very evidence that the claimants relied on to get the imaging order in the first place. Um, so it'll be a question now at this stage of um, what has the defendant said about their level of wrongdoing for this return date hearing in a witness statement or affidavit um, such that they can be trusted to do the um, first cut at um, the disclosure um, exercise. Um, all of that really only begs the, uh, to answer the question, who does it first? The question will um, then be, uh, how was the disclosure exercise done? I think at this stage, with the um, with the image being um, being present on some disk or device, um, search terms will be the usual way of doing it. Normally, the parties will be able to agree those. Um, by agreement with the parties, it might be that they can agree that that's, a, that's actually a computer expert rather than one of the parties who who um, who does the first um, cut of it. Um, and last, I just want to say at this stage, it might be also at this stage that the um, the claimant seeks some kind of delivery up and uh, destruction, uh, a deletion order as an adjunct to, um, to inspection. So that's just looking at the return date um, hearing from the point of view of um, inspection. The third type of hearing I wanted to look at is another inter partes um, hearing um, at the outset of litigation before pleadings, etc but not one where there's been an imaging order made at a without notice hearing, one where there hasn't. So this is the stage, the first time the claimant comes to the court, the court is on notice to the um, defendant. And we've seen, and I've said, that destruction is the pivotal question. Are there serious concerns about destruction? That's always gonna be less likely at this stage because the defendant's been given notice of the proceedings, effectively they had the chance to um, destroy uh, documents if they were going to. And that's more or less potentially more or less what happened in the case of uh, Tank and Crossan that Sam uh, referred to. Um, in that case, the um, uh, judge said there's no reason why Mr. Crossan should not be entitled to comply with disclosure obligations in the normal way. No evidence before me that he's like destroy, damage or conceal um, evidence. So you can see at this interim stage it's going to be harder to rely on the the destruction um, of documents. But it's at this point that case of um, Evel that Sam referred to comes in. And in this, at this stage of the proceeding, the first hearing of um, uh, an application, looking at imaging, not looking at uh, inspection, just looking at um, imaging, what the um, court did in Evel was took a rather more um, laid back view um, of the test. Um, and um, applied that test of, well, there's a suspicion that in the absence of an order, the party will fail to comply um, with his obligations. Um, it's a suspicion, and almost certainly more than that, um, was the test. So in that case, there was this watering down of that test of real possibility of destruction, effectively do something on a, on a, on a pragmatic basis um, to, um, to preserve evidence in circumstances where the judge had a suspicion, but no more than that, um, that the defendant might um, destroy um, documents. So um, even in that case, even though it's inter partes, you can still use a standard form 
um, that's been been drafted for without notice um, hearing. Um, and again, first hearing of an interim application, only looking at in, um, at inspection at um, uh, imaging, um, not necessary at this stage to look at um, uh, inspection. That might be done in the usual way in the course of proceedings. And just the last um, point uh, of the litigation process I wanted to refer to, just for completeness really, um, is imaging in the ordinary course of um, disclosure. And this is um, where the case of JD Hood, JD Classics and Hood comes in. So this was a case where the judge actually looked at the higher test, the one that underpins search orders, um, saying this is an intrusive order, saying that an order of this kind can only be made to prevent a denial of justice, but found that where a defendant hasn't been complying with their dis disclosure obligations and can't be trusted to do so, um, in those circumstances, an order might be um, uh, might be made. This is a situation where in disclosure, it became apparent that the defendant who'd given disclosure had actually not told um, the other side in the court about various um, accounts um, and documents and indeed devices that he had that obviously existed because of reference to them elsewhere, but he hadn't given disclosure from. So the judge made clear that unlike a search order um, or an imaging order um, at the interim stage, um, this was not to preserve evidence um, under Section 7 of the Civil Procedure Act. This was just a means of searching the uh, material. But you can still see um, in this station, uh, in this situation, the pressure it would put on a defendant to to be open, to to comply with their disclosure obligations properly. So in all these cases, um, it does appear the key test is whether or not um, there is some evidence of different standards of destruction or concealment. And where there is, where there's um, evidence of um, a real possibility that's taken place, um, then um, this is a valuable weapon uh, and one which um, your clients, if you're a claimant, um, will be well advised to consider going to the court without notice. But there might be situations um, where there's a bit of caution uh, about that, um, where that test might not be met, but there's merely a suspicion that they might not comply with their obligations. Um, that one might go with notice um, to the other side uh, and seek the order for imaging as a with notice um, hearing. And as we've seen in either of these situations, it's a very valuable tool. It may force settlement or even capitulation uh, by um, a defendant, but at the very least, it will force the defendant to engage very seriously with their own disclosure obligations, which might be just as valuable um, in the winning of a case.